Welcome to another Fix Your Gut live stream. My name is Jason Hooper, and we're here with John Brissom. Hi, everybody. Just wearing my Dave Asprey shades on, so. <laughs> Guys, it's uh, it's John's birthday today, so give yeah, him a shout out. Wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday to me. I'm old man. I'm 30 years old, so half my life is gone by now, so. Half your life? Yeah, I'm not expecting to live past 60, so. What? Yeah, it's a Briston family curse. Only my grandparents have lived that long. No one, you know, no one besides them have. So, well, uh, John says in, in lieu of sending flowers, <laughs> uh, please send donations to help uh, pay for his tombstone. Yes, please. Um, his, would, his burial plot. It help, help out a lot. You know, most it's sad because. When it comes to July and February, those are the d the dates that I get scared as far as months out of year because my family members have all died within the, within those months. So, you know, I don't know. Sorry about dragging down. Hey, we're talking about gluten today, so might as well drag down everything, make people depressed and sad, huh? That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, but again, thanks to all of our donors. And uh, if you'd like to make a donation, if you could spare a dollar or two. We're still raising funds to help improve our streaming equipment and making a higher production show so that uh, you don't have to see like picture frames behind me. You can, we're going to green screen that out. We can put up graphics and stuff and do some cool things uh, depending on our, our budget. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a few things that we want to have on the works, but we need no donations. One of those things would be to to test certain probiotic supplements to see if they're alive. And I'd also like to get one of those fancy EMF testing meters and see if those uh, uh, those filters like sterilizer and stuff like that in green wave to see if they actually do anything or not. And then go around and test certain things in the house and see exactly how much EMF they give off. Um, I'm pretty sure that refrigerators give off a little bit of EMF and so does uh, um, electric dryers, but it'd be something else that I would love to do hopefully in the future sometime. I can, um, I like, this is going to sound stupid. It's going to sound like, uh, I mean, I've, I've listened to podcasts and I've heard guests say things that sound really ridiculous, but my hearing, I'm a musician, my hearing's really sharp and I can hear higher frequencies that most people can't hear. So can I like printer frequencies when the printer's on like the old dot matrix printers or sometimes televisions I can hear the, the yeah. buzzing sound. Yeah, like the uh, cathode ray tubes. I can yeah. hear the capacitors. I can hear the capacitors firing up, and so I can like hear. I can hear sources of EMF. It sounds weird. I'm not actually hearing the EMF. I'm just hearing the the capacitors. The generator. What's generating? Yeah, me too, man. I always found that to be weird. My father could too. And another thing that I think is weird is is we used to be able to blow a lot of light bulbs in the house. Must have had a lot of electricity built in our systems or something. Yeah. I actually just got some green wave filters. Yeah, I got some too. I'm just so curious to see if they work or not, man. Yeah, I just got them. Um, uh, one of my coworkers from Bulletproof um, sent uh, sent them to me as a as a gift for my newborn son. It was like in this care package he sent, along with a crap ton of unfair advantage, which I'm eating by the pound now. And uh, and so. Yeah, I've been trying them out on the house just to see what they do. I haven't really researched it a lot, but apparently on the site they sell this plug-in kit and it yeah, helps you optimize where that's you what I wanna, them. That's why I want to try to run waste funds to see if, if, if we can really get down to the bottom and even buy a cheap EMF meter, you know, one that would scientifically work just to see, you know, is this stuff real or is it not and try to get down to the bottom of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we, could, we could talk about EMF another time but, but that's you know, not even, today. <laughs> even, if it, even if it is you know I mean EMF is real it's there but we have to assess how much damage it's actually doing to us and we kind of have to look at its attenuating effects um, we do know that it does have an effect uh, we, we just kind of want to know what that effect like and we know what the effects are we just want to know how much of it is an issue depending upon the frequency we're getting and the amplitude of that frequency. So if you have a Wi-Fi signal going through your house and it's at, you know, X hertz or something, you know, and it's it's uh, it's coming through, what is it, act, you know, how much of that is actually affecting you? How much of it is attenuating versus passing through? And you know, there's. There, there's a whole equation to I guess the lowest the, frequency, the lower the frequency, the better, like 2.4 over 5, prefer to 5 gigahertz, right? 
Well, that, that's an interesting thing, yeah, because like the uh, the lower frequencies are actually going to be um, absorbed more than the higher frequencies. Uh, wait, I just said that backwards. The I was about to say, it sounded like you did there for a minute. Yeah, the higher the higher frequencies are going to be absorbed more than the lower frequencies. Correct. But then also the higher frequencies are going to be absorbed by other stuff too. So like if your Correct. door is closed, it's going to be absorbed by the door. So like, okay, so test it out. If you have a cell phone in, uh, or you know whatever, a laptop that's connecting up to Wi-Fi, and you close the door to your room, how much signal do you lose? Not generally, not much. I mean, heck, I can connect weekly to the neighbor's Wi-Fi two houses down. Well, yeah, but I'm like, do you lose any? I mean, is it there's? I mean, there's obviously some <laughs> measurable amount. I guess a little um, bit. I mean, it, it, it's 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 supposed to be due to how close you are to the point of source itself is what really matters, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing about attenuation is the 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 further you get away from signal, the more it decays and, and because of of the attenu attenuation, but where is it attenuating? Is it attenuating you? So that, like, there's a lot of questions behind it. Um, well, I mean, there's there's just a lot that needs to be asked. There's, uh, and, and kind of like our, our topic of gluten today, there's a lot of theories, but there's not a lot of hard science to back any of them up. And no, there's so a not. Lot of people, a lot of people have theories, and they just, they're basically just filling in the gaps with hypothesis. You know, some of them are good, but, um, most of it's yet to be proven. But uh, yeah, another cool toy I got, speaking of EMF, is uh, I got a Fitbit a few days ago, a Fitbit Charge HR, which I'm actually really enjoying. Um, all the cool kids are getting these Fitbits. Yeah, John's so, not going to have one on him. I'm not putting one on my body, I'm sorry. Yeah. He, no Apple Watches either, I'm good. Yeah, there. it's actually not connected right now. It's just, uh, it's just, Got a sensor on there that is that's storing my heart rate, and I can plug it into a computer and have it connect that way instead, or, or I can just do it once. I can sync it up to my phone um, if I need to. So it's not like it's sending EMF through my body all day long. I mean, oh, I know you're a, right. It's tiny I, little I, bit of EMF from the device, but it's very low power. I, I just didn't know if it was actually singing a Bluetooth signal. That's all. It it can send a Bluetooth signal to connect, but it's not a constant. Oh, okay. It's not a constant okay. Connection. Okay. I don't know if it was a constant connection or not. That's what would matter. I think you can make you can set it to where it is a constant connection, and you get updates from your phone. It would and stuff. not do that. Yeah, it, dra it, it drains. Would not the do battery. that. Yeah, it, it drains the battery. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I am I am sadly not a trans like a transhumanist like Dave Asprey is, where I'm very much against a lot of this technology even though i use some of it because we do not know its effects on the body well i mean it's just shining like lights onto my arm just well to, i mean that yeah but i'm talking about once we get into more crazy kind stuff. of show you i can kind of show you what it's doing you see that how it's like blinking it, it, yes it works the same way a pulse a pulse oximeter would work yeah I, that's fine that's harmless but i'm talking about like greater technology than that like walking around with you know google glass on and stuff like that yeah, well, I mean, a lot of people walk around with cell phones in their pockets and stuff. Yeah, but you're not strapped in it to your head. Yeah, well. But hey, we're cool. talking about uh, talking about gluten today, people, and uh, me and Hooper uh, agree on a lot of things. But you know, we're going to touch a whole different bases, and then we're going to probably talk into opioid peptides, which you know, it's going to be lots of fun. This is going to be a, a great episode for people who are interested in. Including its effects on the body. I disagree. I'm not a fan of this episode. I'm probably, <laughs> I'm probably not going to watch it. <laughs> but um, I, where do you want to start? Do you want to start on the gluten proteins? Do you want to start on the opioid peptides? What, yeah, what, let's just start on what gluten is. So gluten is uh, gluten is a protein that comes from a lot of different plants, a lot of different grains, uh, wheat, rye, barley, rice. Oats, like a lot of a lot of different things, uh, have gluten in them. Um, well, they have. Well, they don't have gluten. They have similar protein structures to gluten. Well, they. I mean, a gluten is a class of protein. So, Correct, like, yeah. it comes from the Latin word glue. So, any of these, um, any of these like uh, sticky proteins that that you know make the 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 starches and the grain congeal. Is a glute is a is a, a type I mean, of gluten. You're, you're right on that 
term, yes, but when we're talking about gluten specifically, we're morally taking talking about the proteins, you know, like you know, gliden and glutenin that are found in wheat and barley and rye. Um, you know, but you yeah. are correct. Sometimes they're, they're different. They they're they're all they're all different proteins and they all react differently. But correct. Yeah, it's it's we just have to get a, a, a just an understanding of what we mean by gluten, and then we can go and say like, okay, well. Uh, this is why some forms of gluten are bad and some are some people seem to be able to tolerate like most people can tolerate the gluten found in rice like you know you, you eat sticky rice or whatever you know the the what is that the jasmine rice the amylopectin yeah well which, and, would, and, which would be the which would be the starch actually well that does have uh, this the sticky well i guess you're right the, the sticky rice doesn't have is you're right. The, the amylopectins don't have, have as much. I don't think they have any gluten in them. The no, rice. they would not. They would. You would be thinking about like basmati rice, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Um. So yeah, it's just um, yeah. They they function they function as storage proteins. They're very similar to to lectin in that um, they they help starches. Uh, they help with storage of starch and, and transportation of carbohydrate, which can be a problem in the gut. The, the main component of the gluten and like the bad kind of gluten that, uh, that everybody is talking about with celiac and stuff, it, we can break it down to some smaller components that, um, that typically cause problems like uh, gladion, like John mentioned, so we have gluten, which is the big protein, and then we have a small section of it, uh, gladion and uh, and gluteomorphin, which is a smaller subunit of the gladion, and even a smaller subunit of the gluteomorphin are the uh, gluten exorphins or the opiate peptides that uh, that John was just talking about. But largely, like the the protein structure like a lot of it if if your digestion's working properly a lot of it's broken down just like any other protein it doesn't break down as quickly and that can be a problem it just kind of Correct. like casein proteins which also have some of the same um, opiate peptides as well and and like caseomorphin yeah caseomorphin yeah the, and and the uh, which is I guess the equivalent the the dairy equivalent to gluteomorphin correct. And also, there's a rare one that a lot of people don't realize that we'll talk about later that's in spinach. It's called rubiscolin. Um, and that's the reason why spinach never really agreed with me when I had digestive issues. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the, so, yeah, so um, if, if, you have, if you have, you know, just a, a really top-notch digestion system, a digestive system, the gluten proteins are broken down fairly well. But if and they're pushed out of the body quickly by the MMC and also the bacteria as well in our body have a lot to do with breaking it down properly in a healthy digestive system. But most yeah. people don't have a perfect working digestive system. So, Right. It's the same thing with certain starches. If you're eating things that digest quickly, they, have less, they are typically less problematic in the GI than things that take a longer time to break down. Correct. So a lot of bodybuilders and stuff will eat um, – will eat a lot of casein and stuff and uh, before bed, you know, like they'll eat cottage cheese. Get horrible or, digestion. Yeah, and uh, and if their digestion's good, which most athletes have really good digestion because they work out a lot and their MMC function is pretty high, and they don't typically have a problem with it, but if they stop working out for a while, they take it some time off and, you know, their adrenals start to relax, then they can they can end up with problems. And that's the same with, uh, with, with gluten too. If you're you're eating gluten and your digestion is, is working great, but then all of a sudden something causes your digestion to become messed up and then it can start causing problems down the road. So we have, we dig into the literature and we see some, uh, we see some issues with gluten and, and we're, we all, you know, we all know about, ce or most of us know about celiac disease. They, it's really difficult to, to nail down the actual cause of celiac, and everybody has their own um, their own opinions of, of why celiac happens, why some people are sensitive, and why some people aren't. And we'll probably we'll probably get some theories a little bit later 
and also um, th the same thing goes with um, what we have. We have another group of people who are, um, it's not called celiac, it's called like uh, gluten intolerance. Gluten, yeah, gluten insensitivity. Yeah, where I, I don't, and I don't really understand the difference between the two. They make it, they make it, they make a difference in the literature. I think, the like, I think the difference in the literature to my knowledge is celiac disease is tested through genetic markers and uh, IgA, IgM, and IgG antibodies to gluten, and, and where s gluten insensitivity is people who may not show those markers or the genetic testing but still have issues when consuming gluten. That's interesting because 100% um, of the population shows markers when consuming gluten, whether you're sensitive or not. It does raise IgA, IgG. But could you say that almost to a lot of different types of foods as well. I mean, you know, the way we test antibodies is archaic the best now, especially when it comes to food. IgG is just exposure to a certain food, and IgA is its effect on the mucosal barrier, but necessarily doesn't mean, you know, d issues with gut permeability. Um, you know, so when we're talking about antibodies, they're not, you know, like food insensitivity tests, when I call it, you know, at least some markers and so forth and so on, they're not the best. It's true, but if you look at the implications of those markers, for instance, you look at the cytokines and interleukins, well, I guess the interleukins would be the subset of cytokines that respond given the IgA, IgG markers, and some are pro, and uh, a lot of those are pro-inflammatory, so Correct. are they creating I'm not saying they're not causing issues, it just depends on person to person. Yeah, I just don't understand because like they say, okay, well, these are creating uh, these. These have genetic cofactors that are messing with people. But then, like everybody has these cofactors. So, what's the difference between a non sense a non sensitive person, gluten sensitive person? Well, here in fix your gut, we believe it has to do with the mucosal barrier, the shape of it itself, and the state of your gut microbiome of whether or not it can break it down or not properly. Um, that would be the difference that they're not studying yet would be my guess they actually there are actually a lot of studies if you look at the autism studies well yeah there's studies in autism you're right but i'm talking about in the general population yeah that's true um and in in these autism studies that are uh, that are in the literature they're showing that um they're showing an abnormal amount of these opiate peptides so remember but we have the large gluten molecule and then we have a subset of that molecule which is the gladian and then we, we have an even smaller component or, uh, than that, which are the um, uh, gluteomorphin. Correct. And then uh, a few tiny, uh, there's actually like a set of uh, five to six amino acids um, called exorphins uh, that are, that are keyed the same, uh, that are keyed the same way to fit the opiate receptors in the brain. Correct. And so from these people with autism, they are finding a lot of uh, these uh, of these in the brain, and their opiate receptors are just clogged up. And but is it because of a poor mucosal barrier, and that's why it get passes the gut, and then the blood brain barrier is broken down by increased LPS over a period of time, and in doing so, that you know the, these these opioid peptides, which normally would not find their way into the brain, find their way into the brain. You know, autism uh, studies with autism, you know, kids that had shown increased levels of clostridia which would lower the butyrate levels in the small intestine, which would degrade the barrier. I mean, there has to be a correlation between all of this, you know? Yeah, yeah there are studies that show that, uh, that in, in the case of autism, when the kids are, when, when they abstain from both gluten and casein, uh, it, they find a substantial difference. There are other studies that show that it doesn't have any impact but when you're doing a meta study and you're taking a lot of information in, let's say you find 10 studies and six of them, or well, let's say five of them show support for something and five of them show no results. How do you rationalize that? Does it have, I mean, they're equal, five, five and five. Do, do, do you say that, that it's producing results or it's not producing It's going results? to be author bias more than likely in that study. Well, and, I'm, and I'm not suggesting if your child has autism, you should definitely stay away from gluten and case. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is, is we can't, blaming the proteins isn't the issue. We have to blame the reason why the proteins are getting where they're not supposed to be in the first place. And even I think you'd yeah. agree with me on that. If I could just go back to the 
the meta study, like the, the, to rationalize uh, the the uh, the information. So we have all of this information, and when we collect it all together, like we have to understand that we have to understand that the if this study says yes and this study says no, we have to look at the assumption that the the false assumption made by this study or this study. So we make a composite of all the information, and we say there's let's say instead of treating them as subjects and saying like we had 10 subjects and five tested positive and five tested negative, um, we, we look at the data that way. So we say there's evidence supporting this in five studies and then these studies showed no results. So if, if, if we get data like that, or even if one study showed positive results and nine showed negative, when we put them all together, we have to figure out why that study showed uh, that showed the, the positive result. Yeah. And so if we get any indication of positive result, we have to figure out why. Was it due to bad procedure? Uh, was it uh, was it due to ANOVA, uh, uh, core ANOVA, or, you know? Uh, Contamination you know. of some sort, right. research error, and bias. So we, we look in, when we look into this, we're seeing enough information to, to, to say, yeah, this is probably an issue in that I, I would say I would say if, if you have a child with autism, I would definitely try abstaining from from gluten and from from Casey. That's I'm not and saying it's gonna, I'm not saying it's going to completely fix their autism, but it's going to help. And and people with autism generally also have a lot of problems with constipation too. Correct, they do because of incorrect MMC, which causes the proteins to react in the first place. Yeah. So another interesting statistic, speaking of constipation, is that. 90% of people who have celiac also test positive for SIBO. So they also Makes have sense. overgrowth in their small intestine. And I was actually, I've actually been corresponding with uh, a gastroenterologist who is not like a typical GI doc. She looks at it. Um, she, she's pretty smart. She looks at these fringe cases like SIBO and, and other things, you know, and celiac and, she she does it. She's not like the mainstream um, GI. So she she's interesting. So I've been corresponding with her via email, and um, I'm gonna write an article with some of the information and, and sort of how she deals with celiac in her practice, uh, and and how that has to do with SIBO and stuff. So really interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean I. I definitely agree with you. I'd even take it a step further that for most uh, uh, parents with kids with autism to, um, you know, also stop all ingestion of opioid peptides. I'd actually go further and uh, have them withstand from spinach, um, you know, with the possible rib and causing issues. It, it did with me. I used to eat spinach and it would irritate my gastrointestinal tract back when I had gluten insensitivity and I still... Uh, avoid gluten now, um, even though I don't really react to it anymore. Um, you know, and it, it, it a lot of had the similar same things. My wife would actually laugh at me and be like, you know, why can't you accept that spinach is causing you issues when you was so easy to accept that gluten was causing you issues? Because no one thinks that spinach would carry any of these similar opioid peptides. A lot of these peptides are based on a sequence of uh, histocene, Histazine, tyrosine, uh, glycine, glycine, tryptophan, and then it uh, the, it terminates with a, a peroxyl group. Correct. And, and so, uh, and then there's a variation where there's like uh, a lutein, like in in between um, the last two markers. But those, like um, the opiate receptors, they have it's it's like you can think of them kind of like weird magnets where you have like. Char positive and negative charges and you have this this peptide floating around and its charge is is that that it matches up with this receptor and it links onto it now the the these uh exorphins are often not alone they're not just by themselves they often have something else attached to them so the thing that, like with morphine uh, for instance it has the same terminal receptor so people are saying like, oh, if you're eating gluten, it's like doing heroin or something. No, it's not that. It's, it's not to that extreme. Not the extreme. No, it's not. But it's... it's it, that it still would be triggers like saying, some of the receptors, though, but yeah. just weakly. That would be like saying that, like, 
BPA or bisphenol A is the same thing as like taking birth control pills when it comes to estrogen receptors. You know, the xenoestrogens doing the same thing. But there's some issues with that. Number one, um, the amount of these peptides that you're getting, like even if you ate like, I don't know, like you went to a pastry store and you just started gorging yourself. I mean, people got to realize too, you're not ejecting this peptide directly into your bloodstream. You know, no, when it comes but, to the morphine you are. But they, it, it is, in some people, it's crossing the blood. The, that is true. That is true. It, is. it and is. And they are finding it in the brain, like intact. That is true. I mean, this is, I'm this say is that happening. It's, 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 not, undi it's, it's undeniably no, happening. I believe you. I'm just saying that it's not, you can't compare the two. Right. It, yeah. Because I'm saying the quantity of peptides that you're getting are fewer than you would yeah. be getting with an, with like a, a, a typical dose of an opiatoid medication, Correct. whether street or medically administrated. So, um, you know, that it's just something that a lot, I don't know, like the, the wheat belly guy, what's that guy's name? Uh, uh, Dr. William Davis. Is that it? I think so, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, you're right, William Davis. Yeah, he's... Uh, yeah, he, he, you know, he's very anti-gluten. So right. if in the spectrum of, of like, is gluten bad? You have like Dr. Davis on one side, who's, who's like a molecule of gluten will ruin your life. And I'll say you have like, Richard Nikolai here on the other side who says it's refined wheat. That's the problem. The iron that's added to it, if he eat natural wheat should be okay. So we'll yeah. put him on the other spectrum or, and Dr. Or, Davis over here. Or like Cybabe. The side babe who says gluten's not a big deal unless you're celiac, which not a lot of people which are. Which I will so. say that we can talk about later the French paradox, their high consumption of gluten and low digestive issues. Yeah. And and their high uh, smoking rates. <laughs> which increases MMC function, people. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, so, so we're finding a lot of these uh, – these peptides, and if if you have SIBO, you you also probably have a weak um, gut lining, gut barrier, um, in the ileum, possibly in the gingium too. Correct. Depending on how bad it is, and so because you're there's so many bacteria there that the lining's worn, and things are going to start passing through. If if you suffer from constipation. Uh, or you know, if you don't just have just a really good, uh, just really good motility, it, you're probably going to have an issue with it as well. Some people can eat it like myself. I have really good motility, and if I eat, you know, I can if I eat uh, a loaf of bread or something. I'm not going to show any outward symptoms of it. Now, if you test my blood work, you're going to see some inflammatory markers, but I'm going to feel fine. So how do I know? You know, I've, I've probably accidentally, I, I abstain from gluten just because I don't really feel that there's a need. There are plenty of reasons not to eat it. Uh, but if I did eat it by mistake, which I'm sure I have, I would never have known because I don't exploit, I don't, um, I don't exhibit any outward symptoms of it. So how do I know if I would have eaten gluten yeah. by mistake? I mean, you're right. I mean, it all depends on genetic markers, which, you know, de depends on, you know, the individual person depends on gut motility and the shape of their, you know, intestinal lining. Um, you know, some people, that's why there are people eating gluten who are, like you said, asymptomatic. Not everyone's walking around dying from it. Doesn't mean that it's not causing inflammatory reactions in some people, you know, that's even asymptomatic. Um, Jason would say it's pretty much everyone. I would say it depends on how well someone can cope with it physiologically. Um, you know, I mean, I don't eat gluten and I wouldn't suggest anybody to really to, you know, would want to, but if you did, you know, there, there are different ways that we could talk about later, the safest <laughs> bread option, I guess, if there is one. I was considering just on the show, just eating gluten, just grabbing bread or something, just eating it to show that it's not going to kill me. Um, but I don't know. I don't have any bread. I mean, maybe I should try it. Years ago, Jason knew when I was sensitive to it, it'd give me horrible migraines and visual aura and loss of vision in my left eye, like I was having a stroke and I'd go vomit. And that was four years ago. And so far, I do not. 
Oedipus. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I should try it one day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so if, if a packaging in America says gluten-free, and it's different for... Different, Depends on parts per million. Yeah, yeah. It, it's different for different, um, not municipalities, okay. but... Uh, countries. Yeah, countries, regulatory bodies. Um, in, in the United States, it's 20 parts per million. So Soylent, uh, by the way, I got a COA from, from Soylent. For 1.5, not 2.0, though. No, I, it's from it's from uh, 2.0. Oh, it is. I thought yeah. it was through 1.5. Okay, no, 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 it's from 2.0. It is. Uh, it it has 28 parts per million of gluten in it. So there's some cross contamination. Even though it doesn't have any wheat in it or anything, it uh, has it has some cross contamination, meaning that they're processing their soy protein in the factory that also processes wheat. So they're getting some cross contamination now. Is that a huge deal? 20 parts per million. Well, Dr. Davis is going to say. Or he has a saying that says like a little bit of you can't eat just a little bit of gluten It's like being a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't. Yeah, but isn't there such thing as hormesis though? I mean unless someone's critically ill you Well, know? okay, that, that's that's an interesting point. So hormesis is when you have a certain stimulus and there's an adaptation that comes from the stimulus so if you have seen the movie the princess bride have you seen that movie, John? Yes, of course. I love it. Andre the Giant. Um, Ontario Mortor, you know, Mortor, I can't pronounce his name. Uh, Mandy, Mandy, Mandy Potemkin. Um, okay. Yes, of course. I, yeah, I love that movie. So there's a part where he goes up against Andy uh, in, in this battle of wits against uh, this Carpathian guy. And he there's a scene where, like, he, he's he, they both have a drink, and he uh, allegedly poisons one of them, and then they're both going to drink it. And they're gonna, and you know, one person's gonna die, and the other person's gonna live. And he says, like, um, over the years, I developed an immunity to isocaine pattern. So suggesting that, like, you can ingest a poison, and over time, it's gonna create a stimulus to, so that it's gonna strengthen you somehow, so that you can build a better tolerance. Well, I don't see any evidence that that's going to happen with gluten. Like that, eating okay. more gluten is going to um, make you. But is it possible due to everything else that we come in contact with? Yeah, I mean, there, there are some, like with, with, with nuts, for instance, um, there are proteins in nuts that some people are severely allergic to, and it, there's data showing that how, how early you expose a child to nuts can really make a difference in their projected outcome of allergies later on. So if and the protein's coming through breast milk too, correct? And it, well, the protein's coming from the wife, you know, as far as breastfeeding, as well as through the placenta, right? Too, as well. I mean, do you, have you heard any correlation with that? I have not. Okay. Um, but okay. if 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 you if you don't feed a child peanut butter or peanuts um, until they're or after the age of two, they have a they have a much much higher chance of being exposed to or being allergic to to peanut proteins. Um, there's a chance I haven't seen any data on it, but there's a chance that that could be the case also with, with uh, gladian with I'm sorry with gluten, and being sensitive to that as well. So, um, well, what about I don't know. what about genetic makeup too? You know, Caucasians, um, you know, through the years, you know, through the centuries, um, you know, we drank cow's milk and dairy products and so forth and so on compared to the Japanese. Um, we have the bacteria in our digestive systems to produce lactase even in during our adult age, and most of us who are healthy, um, you know. So is well, it? We produce uh, lactase as well. Well, we do, the, but very. But, we have two. We have like beta gal correct. one and beta gal two genes. Um, but we but we, we do rely on the microbiome too as well to help us out. I think um, some of it's epigenetic as well. You have to have a certain presence. Uh, you have to have a presence of lactose in order for um, that gene to be tra beta gal one or beta gal two to be transcribed so that you have uh, lactase which is an enzyme that breaks down lactose so if that did happen in populations that ingested you know dairy throughout you know the millennia um, you know what about gluten I know gluten hasn't been around I'd say as long as we've been ingesting milk especially even a human milk has a little bit of you know lactose in it actually more than a little bit has a lot of it but still nonetheless you know what about gluten I mean there has to be some sort of 
adaptation in the microbiome, especially in populations that have ingested it for a long period of time, right? I think that the adaptation is uh, in a negative way. I think that we're okay. ad adapting to it, not to our benefit. I'm just trying to give a counterpoint, that's all. Well, I understand, but okay, so you're talking about like the einkorn, uh, the European einkorn that was around seems to have a more tolerable form of gluten. Correct, or unrefined flour without the adding of iron. You know, Richard Nikolai, Duck Dodger say the addition of iron, which iron does feed overgrowth. We do know that because bacteria require iron for proper metabolism, biofilm formation. You know, so is it possible that when we enrich the wheat and moved it to these, like Dr. William Davis claims, bigger, you know, amounts of gluten and modern wheat combined with the iron enrichment. Is this the reason why people are reacting? You know, of course, you know, standard American diet, slow motility, so forth and so on. Is this the reason why people are reacting so negatively to gluten? Is it really honestly the gluten to blame or is it all these factors with it? Um, I'm going to say that it's irrelevant because the thing is, okay, yeah, you could make the argument that iron inflates the population of bacteria in the gut, but the, the problem is not the iron. The problem is the bacterial population. Correct. So what about people that have too high of a bacterial population but aren't eating um, fortified iron foods? They're still going to have the same – they're going to have the same problem. Correct. You're right about that. Uh, so – it's it's just uh, I don't know it's just a, an incomplete argument I would say it's it's not that's not that cannot be the conclusive statement. But then we come back to the French paradox. Why are the French walking around with high celiac you know disease? Is it just because of their? It's just a totally different culture compared to America, for example. I mean, is that why? I mean, they consume tons of gluten. They consume a lot of casein, um, you know, and they're just not having the digestive issues. Yeah, they, they don't have the digestive issues. Um, then I mean, that's the thing. The minute they have the digestive issues, then they're going to start to have the problems. But yeah. the other thing with, with uh, French cuisine is that um, they typically eat, like if you, if you eat like really, you know, if you eat really nice French food, they serve, you know, you get a big plate and you get a little bit of, you know, if you go to a fancy restaurant where they, serve you stuff a course at a time in a palate cleanser in between a lot smaller portions. And so okay. number one, you're not eating as much of it. Number two, they take more time in the procedure of preparing food. So most of the French cuisine they spend, you know, it's not like fast food. They spend a long time cooking it. They spend a lot more time aging the cheeses cheeses and the sort of yeast they use are not fast acting it's it's a slower process and so it could be that the cross reactivity to the yeast involved is is not as high um, that's a theory that's out there yeah that's but right and that's like my, Richard Nicola says you know eating less you know might be better for our digestive systems in the long run he correlates that with a lot of gluten ingestion yeah but uh, the 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 uh, the digestion is key though, that if they have better right. digestion, they can handle it better. And the moment that goes away, they're going to have problems. So everything else is irrelevant, you know, yeah. the, the type of yeast or whatever, it, those are just all kind of like, you know, right. whatever. If you, we get I, to the, the issue, the issue is MMC. And, and I agree with you. I just wanted to give a counter argument that a lot of people would give just so we can give explanations of why that might not necessarily be true. Just like Mexico has one of the highest rates of IBS and SIBO in the world now because most Mexicans have sadly adapted the standard American diet and the problems that come with it. Well, the other thing is that you have to understand is that these types of yeasts in, in, in Mexico, the, the bacteria from, from drinking water and, you know, they boil the drinking water, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not going to kill everything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there, there's cross reactivity between those organisms and what's already in your gut. So Correct. if we're, if we're consuming more aggressive types of yeast, it's going to create a different Im uh, imbalance in the microbiome. Some things are going to benefit, some things aren't. And we could actually end up with, uh, you know, more aggressive pressure, which is going to create um, problems with motility because we're having to fight that pressure to pass bowels. 
and in in Mexico, it's a different issue. It's with uh, with bacteria. They're they're consuming more bacteria unintentionally. But the rates have shown since they've adopted the standard American diet, especially the Mexicans that have come into America, um, that's where they, as far as the studies shown on the populations have shown, it's because of the adaptation and change in the diet um, that they added a lot more processed foods in, um, which could have done, a, you have to agree with me, could have done a gut microbiome shift into a negative way. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's possible that, that that could have happened also. You know, there's there's a lot of other things to look Correct. at. There's so many other factors. And there's and a lot the, of stress involved uh, from, yeah. from from immigrating. There's a lot of stress involved, um, and that that's going to affect everything too. So, so when it comes, I don't to, know if there's one magic bullet for for that. Except no, you know, you're what, right. When it comes to the gut, I'm guess there's we're talking about there's a whole lot of issues that can cause a whole lot of problems. The reason why people can't digest these things. Um, you know, and it, it does definitely seem that, that, that seems to be a lot to do with it. Of course, Jason and I would probably agree that the biggest key point is motility, um, for a lot of, you know, for ingestion of a lot of these things, you know, cause the longer it stays in our gut, the more we react to it. That's right. If, if you have fast motility and you eat something that is harder to digest, you have the ability to digest it quicker because you've got a better digestion set up. Or if that's not the case, at least you pass it faster before bacteria get a hold of it and attach um, endotoxin to it or allow it to be passed through the, the gut lining. So, um, you know, it, the, these, these complicated proteins, they, we, have every, we have every ability to break them down. We have the enzymes required to be able to break them down. It just takes a while. And if we don't get the first crack at them in, in sort of the hotter places in our in our um, in our digestion, like the stomach and uh, the they duodenum, do you know, where we just have a lot of enzymes and a lot of bile, and it's just you know we're just uh, that that's that's where we process the the most of our food. And if we miss that opportunity, or if it doesn't get broken down enough, and and it goes into our small intestine then that's where we could have bacterial overgrowth because the bacteria are going to start consuming that. And, and at that part, in that part of, um, of the gut. Where the pH the, is higher and everything. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the pH is, is a lot higher. And there are bacteria that, that can consume these substrates uh, or foodstuffs at a much higher rate than we can in the small intestine. So that's why we have overgrowth. And then the overgrowth leads to other problems. Um, higher, there's higher endotoxin being produced. The gut like permeability drop. The gut permeability increases, <laughs> and it just it, it, we end up with uh, pathogenesis. So I mean, you know, pretty much as far as gluten, Jason and I would both agree that for most people should abstain from it. Um, you know, but if you are relatively healthy digestive wise and have normal motility, the occasional ingestion of it is not going to kill you. It's not something to be orthorexic about. I think that the quantity of gluten does matter. Yeah. Because you're talking about the amount of substance that's going to be reacting in the small intestine. I mean, it's so a hamburger bun might be better than a whole pizza. Yeah. But I mean, so the reasons to, if we made a list of the pros and cons, the reason to eat gluten is because it's delicious. It tastes fantastic because who doesn't like pizza? And wheat does have a little bit of nutrition to it. it. It does. I'm not saying it's worth it, but there are some, you know, vitamins and minerals in gluten itself and fiber, which fiber could be debatable whether or not it's healthy for the gastrointestinal system or not. But those you can still put those in the pro column. Yeah, I mean it has it has nutrients. It has starch. You know, it, it has, can sustain you if you had to eat it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean even if you were celiac and the only thing you had to live was was gluten. I mean I'm sure you'd eat that. But I think that the the problem is that there are extremists on both sides of the of the fence on this issue again, where and there's not enough, I guess, pragmatic thought about gluten now. Just because I don't eat gluten doesn't mean I don't think anybody should eat gluten. It's the same. You just have to make uh, yeah. that choice for yourself. I mean, you have to make that gluten, choice tastes, for 
it wouldn't taste awesome. You're not going to get addicted to it. Like, you know, there's not enough, like, like Dr. Davis would say, you know, the opioids are going to make you dopamine. It's going to make you crave it to the point where you can't give it up, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of like myths about gluten that are out there that, uh, that I think are ruining the argument for why we really shouldn't eat gluten. And that's because it could slow down our motility. Once Correct. we start to get constipated, once we start to stop passing stool regularly, then you need to eliminate it entirely. But if, if you're, if you're regular, you're going all the time, you know, you're going three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, something's coming in, something's going out the other end, you're probably going to be asymptomatic towards it and you could probably get away with it. You're going to show some in your blood work, it's going to show some inflammatory markers as a result. But if they don't seem to, um, to manifest in any quantifiable way, you know, if there's nothing that you can measure, uh, observe, measure, or reproduce, it's, I mean, it's just a, a concept or a theory at that point. Um, so why don't I eat gluten? It's, I mean, it tastes good, but it, to me, it doesn't taste good enough to eat it despite the risk. I don't know. It might, it might be a little orthorexic. I don't know, but. And I mean, I'm the same way. I don't eat it because of my prior experiences of it making me feel bad when my digestive system was a lot worse. And because of that, I do not ingest it now. Now, if I ever get a chance to go to like say shops in New York city, for example, and have the mac and cheese pancakes that I've wanted to have for like six or seven years, then by golly, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it unless it's something extraordinarily special. So the thing is, whenever I'm in New York, like, it's, I'm never there for fun. I'm always there to work. And so I want to risk like getting messed up. Like if I'm going to get messed up, I'm going to do it like during the summer where I got nothing going on, you know, it's yeah. the off season and I'm just going to like, Hey, you know, let's we can try some macaroni pancakes or whatever. Um, going to get ripped. Get ripped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Um, but yeah, but I mean, I don't, I wouldn't avoid like, foods because they're cross contaminated. Like I wouldn't necessarily avoid oats because. Unless you are sensitive to the oat, pro oat, oat, oat proteins like avian, it can happen in some people. Yeah. But I mean, usually oats are processed. I mean, if, if you, if you have steel cut oats, especially that have a Correct. much higher instance of gluten than, than the uh, instant or roll or whatever roll oats. But I, I don't really see that as being uh, as much of a problem is eating like sliced bread. So, and, and the type of gluten you're getting is not yeast reactive because you're getting it from a wheat flour that hasn't been baked or processed with yeast. Yeah, so like if you're eating a chocolate bar on the assembly line that says may have came contact with gluten, you know, as long as you're not severely celiac or you react to everything, um, you should be fine. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say like we should be afraid of gluten, like, um, and unless you're really sensitive to it to the point where it's causing you a lot of pain, discomfort, I don't think that uh, we should run in fear from gluten or, you know, whatever. Because our, you know, if we are healthy, our bodies can handle whatever little bit parts per million that we come in contact with. I, yeah, I, I definitely think so. Even if it's not healthy, um, you could probably come in contact with it. I, I would like to see a double blind placebo controlled study with celiac patients where you have something that's over 20 parts per million and see if they respond or not to that little amount. What's crazy is there have been some studies, if I remember correctly, that some celiac people were not reacting to straight vital wheat gluten purified by itself, but would react to the whole wheat product itself. So they're just reacting to wheat proteins in general, not necessarily gluten. Yes. Okay. Well, that's interesting. That, that has thrown some doubt in a lot of things and a lot of the uh, pro-extremist uh, pro -extremist people for gluten, um, you know, will say that, hey, look at this. You know, why aren't they reacting to pure purified vital wheat gluten? You know, why are they, you know, reacting to the, you know, the wheat product as a whole instead of, you know, gluten can't just be the brain, you know, they're not reacting to it. Hmm, it's out there. Yeah, I don't, 
I don't really know. I haven't really thought of that. I, I haven't seen that study, so. Could it be possibly that they're reacting to the fructans in the wheat instead of the gluten itself? Maybe they have overgrowth and they're reacting to the fructans and not to the gluten. I'm just throwing it out there as a counterpoint. I'm not necessarily saying I agree with it, but. I mean, that's it's definitely within the realm of possibility for sure. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, wheat is a high FODMAP food. Because of um, the fructans, correct? Yes. Yeah, it's a polyol. Or no, it's a... Uh, yeah. It's fructan, so it's a, a, fructan is a, a, a malgation of fruct fructose-type molecules, starches. Right. Not, a, yeah. not necessarily a polyol. But yeah. Of, yeah, like FOS, uh, GOS, MOS. It's in that family. But you are correct that... I, I, that's one thing that I've always thought of, and I do think about stuff like this from time to time, is, you know, what if glutens get the horrible rap in reality... You know, it's fructans because they're having a lot. Like we were talking about SIBO and celiac disease. Um, in in that same study, they brought out a lot of uh, of inclinations of that too, as far as the FODMAP diet is concerned. Um, you know, because feeding people high FODMAPs have almost the same markers the celiac disease does, except for the specific gluten markers. But as far as the digestive markers are concerned, as far as permeability, they all also have the same issues, the same markers arise from that. You know, if you give someone who is sensitive to fructans, for example, you give them garlic, the same markers could arise, you know, as if you give them, um, you know, um, wheat, um, you know, because they're both high fructan foods. So there's going to have to be like a Venn diagram drawn, you know, with like the circles <laughs> and some inter intercepting points because there's gotta be a I, lot I wouldn't studies. say I, like the exact same biomarkers aren't going to present. They're going well, to I mean, not, not the gluten proteins, no, but the biomarkers as far as um, increased LPS in the blood um, and, as, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and some of the inflammatory like cytokines, for example, were positively correlated between feeding someone certain FODMAPs that they're allergic to and, you know, compared to, you know, vinyl wheat gluten. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be some crossover between the two for sure, but you won't get the exact same. I mean, it's not going to be the exact same thing. Yeah. I mean, like Jason and I aren't going to say, hey, if you want to eat gluten, you know, you know, don't because it's going to kill you. I just say, hey, you know, you might not want to eat as much of it. Like if you're a vegetarian or vegan, for example, you know, you might not want to eat as much as that you are everything in moderation. You know, it's, yeah, it's one of those things. And I like if your digestive system is bad, you should definitely negate it, though. You should, you, should, you should vary your diet anyway. I mean, you should like try yeah. to eat a lot of different foods and get a lot of things going to try to develop more micro diversity in the gut because you know, from just one meal, one meal that you eat can we'll change your can, can shift your uh, gut biome significantly. Now, um, so if like you eat uh, a, a meal with a lot of gluten protein once and you do it like multiple days in a row, your risk factors are going to go up and up and up because you're eating something that is hard.
Well, that was weird. That's our show. Um, we'll see you next time. Oh, there's John. Sorry about that. The gluten mafia took me off the air. So. Yeah, uh, we both crashed. I don't know what's going on. I crashed. My whole screen froze and locked up. Is that so the same did thing mine. happened to you? Same thing happened to me. Then I couldn't lock back on. It would not let me to. It yeah. would not let me log back on. I had the same problem. That's weird. Sorry about that, you guys. I apologize. I have no idea what type of what type of glitch that was. That was very weird. Yeah. Well, whatever. Um, so anyway, I was just talking about like if you were going to eat gluten, do it once in a while. You know, limit your intake. Don't do it every day because it's going to influence your gut biome negative negatively. Maybe um, consider taking DPP four enzyme if you decide to. Just for a little bit of a safety precaution, it won't help celiacs, but it might help people who uh, right um, for, for, ca occasionally ingest it. For people with celiac or high inflammation markers, they might want to, uh, you know, avoid it. Like people with uh, JRA or you know uh, different autoimmune things, they might want to avoid it. It's just you know, but SIBO, you definitely want to avoid it. Oh, you still having issues? No, no, I was, I had another window open that had like two minutes of dead air and then it was a loop back to what we were doing. Anyway, sorry for the technical problems. Don't, don't know what's going on here. It's but the gluten mafia. They don't want us to tell, expose the truth. The, the gluten mafia. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Wheat Farmers Association of America, if such thing exists. <laughs> yeah. So... Anyway, that's our show for today. If you made it to the end, congratulations. Um, <laughs> there, was a lot, there was a lot of fun banter back and forth. We challenged each other on a lot of things. This was a more aggressive show. Even though me and Jason agree on a lot of things, I had to keep him up on his toes just because there'll be a lot of detractors. Can't wait to read the comments. Um, you know, especially when people are like, because this is a very polarizing topic, just like vaccinations, which is a surprise we didn't get a lot of vaccination comments, people hating us on that, saying they don't work and blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, but, you know, it's just, it's funny because I'm pretty sure we can get some people who say, how did you, Kim, you say that, you know, people can eat gluten if they're in good health, you know, and coming in contact with it every so often is not going to kill them. And other people are going to say, how could you say gluten so bad? And I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Well, I don't know. If... The, the thing that I look at is when you're looking at a consequence or a result, is it something, is the result something that you can observe? If it's not, then it's, it's irrelevant. Is it something, is the observable effect measurable? And can you repeat that process and get the same measurable effect? And all three of those have to be true. You have to be able to observe it, measure it, and, and reproduce the result. Otherwise, it's nonsense. It's not. It's not really science. So with gluten, um, some people can eat gluten and not have a measured, observable response, and they can repeat that, and they don't. They all they display the same symptoms. Some people have uh, have a lot of symptoms. Now, if you get dig deeper and look into the blood work, you'll see some stuff. You'll see some inflammatory markers going up, which is a decent reason not to eat gluten. If even if you're not sensitive. But if, if you don't know, like, I don't know, like if, if your inflammatory markers go up, but you can't experience anything that you can quantitate other than what's in a blood lab, is it bad? Mm. I mean, I will say today was my birthday. You know what I ate? Um, my favorite uh, Mexican restaurant with my family, you know, the meat probably had some soybean oil on it. Um, the fajita meat that I ingested, you know, had, you know, guacamole and sour cream, you know, was it the best meal in the world? No. But, you know, once in a while, it's not going to kill me. That's what life is. You know, you can either eat completely green on the bulletproof spectrum, which, you know, I don't even think Dave recommends. Um, or occasionally you can eat some yellow and red foods, depending on what you have available. Yeah, yeah. Life's too short to be worrying about it too much. I mean, if you have a big presentation the next day or if you have some kind of high risk, high reward activity coming up, probably you want to eat green. You, you don't know. want to take too much risk with your yeah. diet. You want to you want to eat safe foods. If you know, if not, you know, 
if it's a special day and you're not in horrible health, you know, eh, it's not going to hurt. It's just, yeah. it's, it's like I said, you just have to, I mean, it tastes good. That's the reason to eat gluten, right? People yes. like to eat bread. That's, that's the reason to eat it. The reasons not to eat it, you just have to make that decision for yourself. I'm not telling anybody to eat gluten. I, I don't think that's a good recommendation for anybody. I'm just saying if you were going to eat gluten, this is what happened. And a lot of people, like a lot of people who are even some of like the most hardcore paleo people would eat at a restaurant and they'd get seafood or something and um, it would turn out to be, or, you know, they, they'd order, you know, wild caught seafood and it turned out, it turns out to be, be something. farmed. Or yeah, not farm, but you know maybe farm, but like they get something that's cross contaminated with gluten, and then they don't. They and then they find out about it a month later, and they're like, "Oh, that restaurant was had cross contaminated gluten in it," and I didn't even know. Like, look, I'm I'm fine. Who knows? You know, and, and if, if it's that, if the effect is that negligible, then it's nothing to be like absolutely afraid of to the point where, like, oh, they put croutons in my salad throw the whole salad away because there could be cross contamination. I could get a crumb. Now, if it does, and now if you do react to it, cause there are some people that react to the most minute amounts of protein, then yes, by all means avoid it. But if you're not, you know, Jason's right about that. Yeah. So make your own choices. If you like the taste of pizza, um, don't eat it every day for sure. And if you do eat sure it every day, just realize you're not going to live to be a hundred more than likely. Unless you got superior genetics. I don't know about that. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, that, I don't, I don't know if there's any correlation on, 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 on um, lifespan with, with eating gluten. Maybe, I mean, uh, maybe you're right, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I would just prefer. I was going to say pizza for more a standard American diet instead of just gluten by itself. Yeah. I would prefer to just deal with, like the tangible evidence, you know, the, the, the stuff that we know about instead of trying to create claims that, that aren't there, like, you know, I don't know. I, I, okay. I that, 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 I, I not agree with you. It's like saying you don't want to say gluten is so bad, bad for you. It's equivalent to heroin. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like that, which is clearly not the same as heroin. I mean, like, um, like, you know, um, Charlie Parker didn't die from eating too much pizza, right? He overdosed yeah. on heroin. I mean, I've never heard of anybody like, oh, what what happened to that awesome jazz musician? Oh, you, you can't know. you can't eat yourself to death though. Well, like horses do it, but I mean, people like you're gonna throw up if you try to eat. <laughs> well, I'm talking about as far as you could be 700, 800 pounds. Well, okay, like the lady from the daytime television thing where they got to take her out of the thing with a crane. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not good either, but I mean, it's, that's probably the result of a lot. I mean, to be seven or 800 pounds, you know, the K cow requirements to be that big. Yeah, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of bodybuilders that would love to be seven or 800 pounds. And, yeah. You're going to have to eat like uh, most people when I've seen them eat, they'll be like five or six pizzas at a time and gallons of freaking soda. Uh, it's it's still like not going to be enough to maintain that weight. I mean, they've obviously got um, bacterial overgrowth, and they've got yeah. a lot of issues. Because they're not assimilating the food nutrition. Yeah, for sure. But anyway, we gotta uh, go, that's you guys. our show. Uh, thanks for watching. Sorry for the technical errors. Have a good night, everyone, or daytime, wherever it is. Take care.